everyone, we're back with chapter six. This is still on part two. Uh, chapter six is on setting up and configuring a PC. The objectives that we're going to learn for the IT Fundamentals Plus U61 exam dealing with chapter six is going, that you will, is going to be you will learn how to prepare the work area, how to unpack and set up a new desktop computer, and how to complete post setup tasks. So there's a lot of things in here that probably are gonna be very obvious, and there's gonna be some things in here that are gonna be important for you to know, especially when it comes to real life and the IT Fundamentals U61 exam. So I've got this broken down in some different categories, and I'll elaborate as we get to each one of those. The first one, thing that we wanna talk about is preparing the work area. So you just bought or are just getting a brand new desktop computer, and you want to set it up. So the first thing you need to worry about in terms of preparing the work area is that you are evaluating your room condition. Now, whether this be at home or at the office or at a somebody else's home that you're trying to help them with, it just depends. Now, the ideal temperature for a computer is anywhere between 50 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Anything colder than that or anything hotter than that can have detrimental effects to your computer. So 50 and 75 degrees is ideal. The humidity level for a computer should be right around 50%. Anything lower than that is going to make the air way too dry. Anything more than that is going to make the air way too wet. And again, things that are the most important um, enemies, or the th excuse me, the things that are the biggest enemies for a computer are heat, which can happen with dry air, and moisture, which can happen with humid air. And also the room should be free of any airborne particles, such as pet or uh, pet hair or dust or dander or things like that. So you want to make sure you, you locate and put your computer in a place where all three of these are ideal. Then you should choose where you want to set up the PC once you have those ideal room conditions. Uh, you want to make sure you ensure that a grounded power outlet is nearby. It should have three, uh, a three-prong plug instead of just a two-prong plug because you would probably want to use a, um, a not a power strip. We're going to talk about these later, but something about a surge suppressor or even a UPS. We're gonna get into each of these a little bit different. Some electrical um, considerations, as we mentioned, make sure that there's a power outlet nearby that is grounded. You want adequate airflow around the case for your case fans to do their job. Very important. A lot of people make a cabinet or put their tower underneath a desk where there's very little space for the air to move. Now you don't want it in harm's way where it can get knocked over and possibly uh, you know, something could break inside of it, but you wanna make sure that it's somewhere between open air and out of harm's way. So you wanna make sure you put it somewhere um, in, in the best place possible. Making a work area more comfortable is important. Now we're gonna talk about a term called ergonomics. And ergonomics is just the study of how humans and equipment interact. When you're using any kind of machine, especially in this case a computer, you don't want it to be to the detriment of yourself. You wanna make sure that you are in a very comfortable but, um, but proper sitting position, that your neck is doing what it needs to to be able to see the screen, that your arms and legs are in a place where it's not going to do harm to your body. So again, ergonomics is the study of how humans and equipment interact. If possible, you want to use an ergonomic keyboard or mouse. Now that is kind of one of those things where it's kind of broken into two different places and you've got a place for your left hand and a place for your right hand on the keyboard or even a, a mouse where you don't have to move it around. So kind of like a, um, a trackball or things like that. Uh, that would be the best. Now, some people aren't used to that and they're used to a regular keyboard or mouse, and that's fine as long as it doesn't cause you any kind of discomfort in your arms or in your wrists. The keyboard should be either flat or 25 degree angle toward you. Very important. Uh, you don't want it to make it so that your wrist is hurting depending on how you're typing. The display, your screen or your monitor should be 16 to 24 inches away 
from the user's eyes. And if you look at this picture, you'll notice how the eye level and the top of the screen is exactly the same. And that's how you want to be. You want to be able to look, you want to look straight at the monitor or a little bit down. You don't want to look up at all because doing that is going to put strain on your eyes or possibly your neck. When you're doing sitting positions, your legs should be at a 90 degree angle and as the same thing is true with your elbows and your arms when you're typing. So your forearms should be perpendicular to the floor while typing and the chair should allow thighs to be parallel and your calves to be perpendicular to the floor as well. One of the things that you want to watch out for when you're setting up a new computer is what we call ESD and EMI. And we're going to talk about both of these at length. ESD stands for electrostatic discharge. Now, if you remember when we talked about the types of screens on a phone, you had the capacitive screen and the resistive screen. The capacitive screen uses human electrical properties to be able to use that touch screen for it to work. So what I'm trying to get at is that you have a little bit of electricity in your body. And the more that you build that electricity up, it could possibly damage your computer. So ESD happens when two objects with different electrical charges contact each other. ESD can damage computer components without even knowing that it happened. When you are ever working inside of a computer case, you've opened up the computer tower and you're working on maybe putting in an expansion card or changing or cleaning a case fan or putting in new RAM or things like that, you want to be very, very careful that you are not discharging a high electric current from your body into some of the electric components inside of your tower. So when working inside the case, there are three ways to go around this. One is to often touch the frame of the case. That is the metal frame on the outside of the case. By doing that now and then, you're going to offset any electrical charge and by putting it into a harmless piece of metal as opposed to a very important computer component. That's one way to do it. The other way is to find your power supply and touch that. Your power supply is what, how your computer is being plugged into the wall or plugged into an electrical uh, source. You can always, again, anytime you get up and come back or anytime you scuff around the floor, you always want to make sure you're touching either the outer metal part of the case or the power supply unit. The third way, which is always the best, is what this picture shows. This gentleman is wearing a wrist strap. It's called an anti-ESD strap. And then and you'll notice there's a wire that comes off of the strap from his wrist, and then you can attach it to the metal case on the outside. This is a constant offsetting the electrical pop properties from your body into the computer. It's a constant thing. So you could get up and you could kind of scuff around and not that you're trying to, but that way it automatically goes into the computer as opposed to any of the parts that you're touching. So it's very important to make sure you watch out for ESD, electrostatic discharge. And the three ways, again, are touching the metal case around the, the computer, the PSU, the power supply unit, or using this anti-ESD strap. The second thing to watch out for is EMI. EMI is electromagnetic interference. This occurs when a cable runs too close to a strong electromagnetic field. A common cause of that would be like a fluorescent light bulb or a possible microwave oven, something that has a strong magnetic field. Now, this is not very common, and this is not as destructive as what ESD could be, but you still want to make sure that if something's not going right, that it's away from a kitchen or a places with high electrical appliances that can give off electromagnetic fields. Before we get into ensuring reliable AC power, I just want to review with you <clears throat> that a standard USA outlet produces anywhere between 110 to 120 volts. Remember, your computer only needs about 10 to 15 volts to be able to work accurately. So remember your power supply unit does two jobs. It converts AC power into DC power and it also lowers the voltage to exactly what it needs. Now your a standard USA outlet is 110 to 120 volts. An international outlet in a different country goes 220 to 240 volts. 
Now, if you take your standard desktop computer or your standard laptop and you plug it into a different outlet in a different country that's bringing in way too much power than what it's used to, it could possibly fry your system. A 110 going to a 220 would bring way too much in and it would be bad to your computer. If you took a 220 computer and brought it over to a 110 outlet, it wouldn't get near as much voltage as what it needs. So there's a way to go around that is that most power supply units have something called dual voltage. There's a switch that you can flip on the power supply unit and it tells the computer whether it needs to expect 110 volts or 220 volts. So it's called a dual voltage power supply unit and it will work on either outlet. Now, so things that can possibly happen with your computer, especially a desktop computer that's always plugged in, is, uh, you know, unfortunately, there's going to be some sort of, in, in the lifetime that you're at the location where you are, you're going to have some sort of power outage, a power sag, or a power spike. I want to talk about each one of those, what they are, and how we can uh, prevent any kind of issue happening when that happens. Now, a power outage is when, the comp is when the power completely disappears. You have no power whatsoever, whatsoever. All the power is out of your house. Obviously, a desktop computer running straight into the outlet would automatically turn off as well, and possibly you could lose some work. A power sag is when you're not getting as much electricity as what you thought you should. 110 volts out of each outlet, you're only getting 50, you're only getting 30, you're only getting 80, you're not getting as much as you want. So it's sagging. You're still getting power, but it's not what it needs to be. And a power spike is when you have a sudden dramatic increase in voltage above the normal voltage. Often a power spike would happen because of lightning. And that's where most things are end up becoming fried, especially our crucial and critical computer systems, because they were not protected. So we were going to talk about the ways that you can ensure reliable AC power and you can protect against an outage, a sag, and a spike. Now, if you have a power outage, a, pow a blackout, or a power sag, then the best way to prevent this is to use a power conditioner. A power conditioner can store extra voltage to smooth the power sags out. Now, a power conditioner cannot uh, typically work very long when it's a power outage, but it can work long enough for you to be able to shut your computer down the appropriate way. A power surge or a power spike is when you have too much power. And so you wouldn't want to make sure you use a surge suppressor. And that's what you see here in this picture. This is a surge suppressor. It's got different places to plug in. You even have some coaxial cable outlets and even some, um, some RJ45 or possible RJ11 outfits. I'm not sure which ones those are over on the side. But this will pre prevent any kind of power spike. Now, if a power spike happens, if your house is struck by lightning, it will fry this surge suppressor, but it will protect everything that's plugged into it. If that happens, you would want to throw away the surge suppressor and get a brand new one. But just keep in mind that it can't withstand more than one. A surge suppressor will absorb this excess voltage. Now, a power conditioner helps versus that first bullet point. A surge suppressor would help during a power spike or a power uh, surge. There is this thing called a UPS, and that will prevent, that will help with both of these. It will protect you for a power surge, a power spike, and a power sag, and even a power outage. What a UPS does, and it's called an uninterruptible power supply, is it stores this extra electricity inside of it by a backup battery. This backup battery will turn on and run as soon as there's either too much power or there's too little power, and it will continue to run your computer. Again, it won't run it for a long time, but it'll run it long enough for you to know that all the power is off or, all the, or something's going on with your power supply, and it gives you enough time to turn it off. It is called a UPS, Uninterruptible Power Supply. It will protect you versus an outage, a sag, and a spike. So one more quick review. A power conditioner protects against um, outages and sags and blackouts. A surge suppressor protects against a power surge or a power spike. 
and a UPS protects against all of it. When you do finally have your desktop PC set up and you want to, you've got it unboxed and you're ready to start doing some things, you obviously need to know what goes where. So there's some physical connections that you need to hook up to the back of your computer and into the proper places where they go. One is using a keyboard and mouse, and typically that's going to be using a USB device. We talked about the old ways of connecting to keyboard and mouse, which is using the PS2s. Uh, those PS2s are long gone, and most new computers that you get will not even have a PS2 port. They are going to have a USB port. A monitor, you can either use a DVI, an HDMI, or VGA, depending on what you have available to you. If it's a Mac, though, you'd want to either use a Thunderbolt or a mini display port. For internet, uh, you would want to use an RJ45 cable if you're using wires or set up a wireless connection using an antenna. And finally, for speakers, it's all about those 3.5 millimeter audio jacks. Uh, the speaker is green, whereas a microphone is pink. Cable management is for you, whenever you plug in all these different things into the back of your computer, you're going to have a mess of wires all over the place. So cable management is, for, is a way for you to be able to uh, organize your cables, make them all run the same direction, and make them look a little bit better. You can use twist ties, you can use binding cables, you can even use these rubber uh, tubes to put your cables inside of to make them all look a little bit better. But it's a way for it to look organized, and also it's a way for it not to get in the way for, in case people trip over it and then do something to your computer that would be bad. When you set up your computer and turn it on, the initial startup program will want the following five things. This is for your OS. It will want you to set up the following five things. Localization. You have to tell your computer what time zone that you're in, what country that you're in, if you follow daylight savings time or not. Because the computer wants to make sure it tells you the accurate time, but you're going to have to tell the computer where you are first. Screen resolution is important, but typically the computer sets up and automatically does it according to the monitor that's plugged into it. Audio settings are the same way. It's going to auto detect these, whatever audio devices you have plugged in and set it up automatically. You can go through and customize those later on if you wanted to. Internet connectivity, it will prompt you to use the one either it found or to configure another one. If you're wired into your computer already, it's going to probably use that one because that's going to be the strongest one. If it's not wired in and you're using Wi-Fi, it will give you a list of available Wi-Fi networks and will want you to connect to one and choose one. And finally, user account. You have to create uh, one user account to serve as the administrator. Now, we're going to get into these user accounts in a little bit, but it's important to make sure that you do have one just specifically as an administrator on this machine. That is the one account to rule them all. That's the one that you want to use the most whenever you're making changes to your computer, I should say. We have other accounts that you're actually going to use the most, but whenever you're making system changes, the administrator is the go-to. Completing post setup tasks. So your computer is out of the box, it's set up, all the cords are in there, you've turned it on, and you've done your initial setup. So the first thing, the next thing you want to do is you want to verify and configure your internet connection. If you have a wired connection, you're pretty much done. It's going to use that one no matter what. If it's wireless, you want to make sure that it's secure. There's something called file and print sharing. And when it is a unsecure wireless connection, maybe it's public that other people can use, you want to make sure your file and print sharing is turned off because anybody could go in and check your files or, uh, or you know, possibly um, other detrimental things that they could do to compromise your computer. If it is a secure connection, a home internet or a work internet, <clears throat> excuse me, Wi-Fi, then you can turn on file and printer sharing. The next thing you want to do is you want to install security software. This is adic uh, you got to make sure adequate security software is installed. Windows has its own security software <clears throat> called Windows Defender. Uh, a more fe full featured program could be used, such as McAfee or Norton Antivirus, but Windows does have a pretty sufficient one called Windows Defender. Before you do any kind of internet browsing 
or any kind of downloading, you want to make sure this internet that the security software is installed to protect your computer before you go into any risky situations. Finally, you want to run your software and security updates. Now your OS will automatically update itself or you can manually use Windows Update if it's a Windows device. And if it's a Mac, you will get OS updates from your App Store. Configuring peripherals. Now peripherals is just a fancy word for things that you plug into your computer, such as your keyboard and your mouse. Uh, and you know uh, maybe a document camera or maybe a tablet or something that you want to use your computer uh, function for. That's a peripheral. You can plug in additional hardware via USB and it will usually prompt you to automatically install drivers. This is called that plug and play feature we talked about. Whenever you plug in something new it's going to automatically install that driver. Some of them may need a disk setup or to find it online. Once you have installed it, you can configure on the operating system program or through the software. Un uninstall unneeded software. There is some software that's going to come with a brand new computer that you are not going to need at all. Uh, and these things can really slow down your computer. So this is called bloatware. Bloatware are applications that most people don't need, but but the companies pay the PC manufacturer to put on your machine. They don't have to be on there forever. If you have a Windows computer, you can get rid of these unnecessary installation software, unnecessary softwares by going to Control Panel, Programs and Features. You select the application that you do not want and click Uninstall. But the key thing is, is that you'll go to Control Panel, and programs and features, or it might just say programs. Programs is where you're going to find this unneeded software through the control panel. If it's a Mac device, uh, you'll go to Finder, Applications, you find the application you don't want, you right click on it and move it to trash. And then with things that you don't want, there might be additional software that you do want. So you want to install additional software. Uh, this will typically be using setup disks or possibly online from the software website. Uh, if it's a disk, it'll automatically prompt you to go through the setup, or if it's a downloaded, it will probably go through a setup wizard. You want to make sure you update or upgrade to the newest edition of whatever software that you are installing. And that can be done through the software device itself. Usually in help, you will see update, and then it will check to see if you have the latest version or not. Now we talked about user accounts. Now all computers should have at least one admin account and one standard account. The admin account is what you go into to, to make system changes, but that is it. That is not for your everyday browsing. That's not to check your email. That's not to play a game. That is to make system changes. Because if your administrator account gets compromised and there's a, a virus or a worm that goes on it, you won't have it to fix other things. So you want to make sure that you are using a standard account whenever you're doing daily use. You can also create other accounts for other users. Uh, it just depends on what, what you have, but you can always go into your control panel and do this using um, creating more user accounts. You can also have personalized accounts with either Apple or Microsoft. It's either iCloud, OneDrive, or unified desktops, depending on where you are. All right, that is it for chapter six. That was um, trying to go through how to set up and, uh, and, and do our, our brand new computer system. And uh, hopefully that helped you to understand things a little bit better in terms of what the U61 exam is asking you to know. Feel free to go back and review this video. We're going to go into the um, review questions for Chapter 6, and hopefully you're able to do well on that to, uh, to understand these. Number one, in which environment would a desktop computer be safest and operate the best? A, inside a small, tightly sealed cabinet. B, in a clean room with a powerful air conditioner. C, on a balcony at a tropical beachfront condo. D, on a TV tray in a living room. Feel free to pause the video if you need time to go through these questions, reread it, and uh, come up with your answer. The answer on this, again, there's not a lot of great 
options here, but the one that's the best is in a clean room with a powerful air conditioner running. That's not just to cool it off. It could be to cool it off if it's too hot, but it's also to get any kind of dust particles and the air quality to be really good. Number two, how far should a user's face be from a monitor screen for most comfortable viewing? A, 10 to 12 inches, B, 12 to 16 inches, C, 16 to 24 inches, D, 24 to 32 inches. This was about ergonomics that we talked about, and the one that's best for the most comfortable viewing is 16 to 24. Any more than that could cause eye strain because you're too close or you're too far away. Number three, which of these is the flow of static electricity? A, EMI, B, ESD, C, AC, D, DC. We talked about both EMI and ESD. The one that causes static electricity is your ESD electrostatic discharge. Number four, what device can help correct power sags? A, power supply, B, power strip, C, surge suppressor, D, UPS. Now, power sag is when you're not getting enough electricity. We talked about the things that you wanna do with that. It would be a power conditioner. That is not an option on here. The other one that would, that would protect from anything in terms of uh, electricity is the UPS. Power supply brings the electricity into the computer. A power strip is important to know because there is no electrical protection on a power strip. It's nothing more than just extra ports for extra items, but that puts all of those items at risk. So when you go into a store and you wanna buy a surge protector or a surge suppressor, make sure it says that on the box because they do sell just power strips, which are nothing more than extra outlets. No protection. The answer was UPS. Number five, what kind of cable is most often used to connect a PC to a broadband modem or router? Now I know it says the word modem, which makes you think phone line, but it talks about a broadband modem, which is gonna be dealing with um, a uh, ethernet cable. So you'll be using an RJ45, which is our ethernet cable. Number six, what should you install before you download and install additional software on a new PC? Remember, as soon as you set up your computer, before you go to any additional software to a website that you want to download and install, it has to make sure that your computer is safe. And without installing security software, it is not going to be safe. So that is the first thing you need to do before you download and install any additional software is put in security software. Number seven, what component protects against occasional electrical spikes? Again, the one that, occur, that protects against these spikes out of your options here is your surge suppressor, A. Number eight, where in Windows can you access the configuration settings for hardware devices like mice and printers? A, File Explorer, B, EMI, C, Start Menu, D, Control Panel. You can go in and do con configuration settings for these peripherals, the mice and the printers, through out of these options through the control panel. Your control panel is the central hub for administrator duties. Number nine, where in the control panel can you remove unwanted applications? A, programs, B, ergonomics, C, setup, D, start menu. In the control panel, we talked about you can see all the different applications that are running and you can remove them through programs, or it might say programs and features, depends on what version of Windows that you have. And finally, number 10, which of these is a type of Windows user account? A, kid, B, standard, C, supervisor, D, normal. The only one that's actually a type of Windows user account is B, standard. You have your administrator account, you have standard accounts. All right, great. Thanks for joining me on this video. This was chapter six of the all-in-one exam guide um, by Total Seminars. Uh, props to Scott Jernigan and Mike Myers for creating that. And this hopefully will help you learn about setting up and dealing with uh, new computers. Let me know if you have any questions down below. Feel free to comment, happy to reply. And uh, we will be back with chapter seven uh, on the next video. Thanks for everybody. And as always, keep on keeping on.